Hey there, interactive developers. Jack Delora here with the Interactive and Immersive HQ. In this video, we're going to be playing with boxes in Unreal Engine. Specifically, we're going to be attaching sounds to these boxes using the MetaSound set of functionality in Unreal Engine. And uh, every time that these boxes collide with either the ground, with me, the character, or another box, they're going to generate a sound which has uh, a bunch of different parameters attached to it. So the MetaSound engine allows us to generate all kinds of different sounds, including those using a variety of different synthesis methods and uh, doing more traditional things like playing back samples. But uh, just like everything else in Unreal, we can work with blueprints to create some very advanced functionality. And we're going to dive into all of that in just a moment. So like usual, we're going to have to start off in the new project dialog to create our project. And like our usual examples, we're also going to use a template here to provide a, a sort of foundation, a baseline of functionality that we can build from. Although the intention here is that you can take this sort of functionality and use it in something like an interactive or immersive installation, we're going to use one of these examples from the gaming section just because they have a lot of the components that we need already set up and make it easier for us to do this in a uh, abbreviated amount of time. So we're going to use the first person example that you see here uh, over in this section on the right. I'm going to leave this in the blueprint mode. My target platform will be desktop. I don't really need to have my quality here set to maximum. So I'm going to set this to scalable. Um, and then for the project name, I will call this uh, UE underscore meta sounds example. Um, oh, which I've hit the 20 character limit. So let's see if I can just do UE underscore meta sounds underscore EX one. Um, after that, I'll hit create. It'll take a little bit to compile and then we'll meet back in the project editor. So our project is loaded up now in Unreal Engine. And what I'm going to do to begin is to start off by getting rid of this BP pickup rifle object that's in the level because I don't want to be able to destroy these boxes. I rather just want to be able to push them around. And so I'm going to click on that or head over to the outliner and click on BP pickup rifle and then just hit delete. Then I'm going to come down to the content browser, right click, and we're going to add in under the audio section a meta sound source. So this is uh, going to then allow us to add a name to this. Right now it's called new meta sound. I'm not sure what they use for the shorthand for this, maybe MS, kind of like blueprint is BP. Uh, so I might do MS and then underscore. So I think I'll do like collision as the name because it's going to be generated when these boxes collide with any other object. Uh, once I've added that to my content browser, I can double click on it and we can get straight into building the node graph for this effect. So right now we have a trigger or an input called on play, which is going to send out a trigger once we start the simulation in our editor window and or start playing the game, etc. when it's finished. We're going to add an additional input, an additional trigger, which we can then actually send a trigger to based on some additional functionality we'll add later when we collide with an object. So I'm going to um, come up here to the input section and hit the plus icon. You'll see that we then have an additional input added into the project. I'm going to change the name of this input in the details section to on trigger hit enter and then change the type down here to trigger. Once I've done that, I can then click and drag from the input section and I'll have a new node added to my network called on trigger. So for this effect, what we're going to want to do is to start by generating a random pitch for our sound to be played at. So I'm going to drag off of the on trigger output and then I will um, grab the random float uh, node here. And this is going to allow us to generate a random floating point value, which we can then um, set a minimum and a maximum value range for. So it'll generate a number between that minimum and maximum. 
For this, we're going to have to think in terms of MIDI note numbers. Uh, we're using that because it's an easier way to define the pitch of the note that we want than having to know specifically the um, value in hertz, which is a, a frequency unit. And so for those of us who are not familiar with MIDI note numbers, uh, there are plenty of diagrams about this online. But essentially, if we're thinking about a keyboard, a piano keyboard, we have different note uh, numbers that are assigned to each note. And we have a sort of standard for this, although it's you know sometimes applied a little bit differently. But essentially, the idea is that uh, we'll have this uh, range of 0 to 127, which will correspond to the pitch of the note. And at least in the example we see here, 60 is uh, middle C, which is around the middle of a piano keyboard. So when I am selecting a range uh, for the values uh, of notes that I want to be able to produce, uh, this is where we're kind of pulling that information from. So we're going to be using a range of 40, which you can see here, up to uh, 72, which is right here, C4. So um, that was sort of an arbitrary choice on my part, but basically it gives us uh, notes that are not either too low or extremely high, and it's just a nice amount of uh, variety within that kind of middle ground. So that is where the numbers that we're going to enter in here are coming from. So I'm going to set the minimum to 40, the maximum to 72, and then I want to take the output that is generated by this node, and I want to add a MIDI to frequency node. And this is going to take that note number we just looked at and convert it into the Hertz value, which is um, what we're going to need to use for our synthesizer uh, oscillators to generate the right pitch. So we've got that um, here. I'm now going to move the output nodes over to the right so we have room to kind of build and um, what we're going to start with, we're going to attach this to a sine oscillator. So what we're going to be doing here is um, essentially making a very simple form of something called FM synthesis, or frequency modulation synthesis, where we have an oscillator that is a, a carrier and then another oscillator that modulates it and basically gives us this more complex uh, synthesis waveform. There's a whole bunch of information on the web about this and uh, is way too much to get into right now, especially if you're not familiar with that sort of thing. But uh, suffice to say, we're going to have two uh, sine oscillators and we're going to be using something called an envelope to control the loudness contour of each one of those things. So the, the frequency that we're going to be generating from this random generator. We're going to want to connect that to the frequency input of our sine wave oscillator. And then um, we're going to add in our first envelope. So um, we're going to have an envelope for the overall output of the uh, sound that we're creating here. And we're also going to have one for uh, adding some modulation or impacting the way that this sounds a little bit. So what I think I'll do now is uh, to make this a little bit more um, easier to, to kind of understand. I'm going to connect the on play uh, pin to the next pin on the random float um, node and then connect the audio out to the out mono option that we have just so you can hear the changes as we're making them. So right now, if I hit the space bar, we just have a simple sine wave. And every time that we hit the space bar, we're generating a different pitch, which is kind of cool. Um, but what we want to do is, you'll notice if I just hit the space bar, it's going to play this sound forever. And we want to have a way to control that. And, and instead of having it just play infinitely, give it what we call an envelope, which will allow us to change that into something that has a decay and can become a little blip instead of a infinitely sustaining note. So what I'm going to do is to add in the envelope. We're just going to use a simple AD envelope, it's called. 
and we want this to be the audio type. And then if we add that up here, um, this is going to enable us to um, take our trigger uh, channel. So I'm going to drag off of the on next output of the random float and connect this to the trigger input of the AD envelope. So we can now trigger this envelope, but we then need to take the output of the envelope, which is going to be output as an audio signal, and we need to use some math to combine it with the output of the sine wave generator. And so to do that, we're going to add in a multiply uh, node, and we want to multiply two audio signals together. So I'm going to add in the multiply audio node. I'm going to connect the out envelope to the first input and the audio out of the sine wave oscillator to the second input. Then I'm going to take the output of the node and connect that to the out mono um, output. If I hit spacebar now, you can see that instead of it sustaining forever, we just have a single uh, nice enveloped note that is playing. Now, if I zoom in here, I can actually change the amount of time that this will decay over, and that's going to essentially take the note back to silence or make the length that the note is playing for less. So I can make it much shorter by setting it to something like 0 0.25, and then I'll hit space, and you can hear. Now we just have a nice short little blip that this is generating. So we could mess around with the attack time as well, and that'll give us a smooth uh, or lengthened ramp as it's uh, increasing from silence to its full uh, volume level. But for this, I wanted a, a sort of plinky, uh, quick, brief little sound on collision. So I'm going to leave that attack time at 0 0.01. So we've got ourselves the envelope for the output of this uh, sound. The other thing that we want to do, uh, as we talked about, is to set up this frequency modulation component, which is where things get a little bit more interesting in terms of the sound that we're generating. So I'm going to add in a second one of these sine wave oscillators. I can just copy and paste this first one and move this over to the left. And for this, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add in an envelope, and we're going to take the output of this oscillator, and we're going to connect it to this modulation input of this next sine wave oscillator. So right now, if I just hit play, you'll hear that we don't have a whole lot going on, um, which is fine. But if we add in an additional node here to increase the amplitude of this sine wave, we can hear it impacting the additional sine wave we have over here on the right. So what I'll do is um, I'm going to insert a node in between um, the first sine wave oscillator and the second one, which is going to be called a map range node. And we're going to use, again, the audio format because we're going to be um, working with audio signals. I'm going to connect the output of this sine wave to the input of the map range. And then I'll connect the output of the map range to the modulation input. Here, uh, we're going to change the out range settings. So basically, to have a more discernible impact on the uh, sine wave in terms of the modulation, we need to increase this output range pretty dramatically. So I'm going to set the out range A here to be 0. And then for outrange B, I'm going to set this to 1,000. And when I hit play or spacebar, you can hear that the timbre of the um, output sound is different. It sounds kind of like a, I don't know, like the dial tone on your phone or something like that. If we change the pitch of this input sine wave to something really low, like 0 0.25, we can hear the modulation in a little bit more detail. So you can hear we have this kind of weird pitch shift going on. And if we increase the decay time, we can hear this even more. So what's happening is we're using this sine wave, now that the frequency or the kind of speed of oscillation is so slow, 
to modulate the pitch of this sine wave up and down over time. And once we crank the speed of this input sine wave up to something really high, it's modulating that pitch so fast that it ends up turning into a sort of non-discernible component of the sound and changes the way that the sound uh, functions. And it starts to generate things called sidebands, and there's all kinds of uh, theory and, and math behind it all. But it gives us a more interesting output sound than just the sine wave oscillator on its own. So um, that is kind of a little theory behind, or I guess explanation and showcase of how that works. What we want to do besides um, uh, just having this sine wave oscillator kind of oscillate at this fixed frequency is we're also going to use the output frequency of our random generator to change the pitch or the rate of oscillation of this sine oscillator so that it doesn't just sound like this sort of telephone uh, kind of beep. I'm also going to use some math here to multiply this frequency value um, so that we can end up with something that is maybe an octave higher than this, this input pitch or more. So I'm going to drag off of the out frequency from the MIDI to frequency node. And here I'm going to use a multiply node, and I want this to be a float. So here uh, in this multiply node, I'm going to set this second pin to be 15. And then I will drag off onto the frequency input of the sine oscillator. And then if we hit play, we'll hear that now we have a little bit more variety going on. It's not just this simple uh, kind of weird telephone type sound, although it still has a little bit of that quality. Um, it's got a little bit of something else going on as well. The last thing that we're going to do uh, in terms of this synthesis portion is to add in an additional envelope. And we're going to place that in between this sine wave uh, modulator and the one that is actually outputting to our audio. Um, so for this, I'm going to use exactly the same type of operator. I'm going to use the AD envelope, I'll control C and control V, copy paste that and kind of move this bit of our node graph down. So here, I'm going to use the AD envelope again um, to manipulate the audio signal that is running into this um, sine wave oscillator. So just like we multiplied them here before to impact the level, we're going to do exactly the same thing here. This envelope is going to manipulate the audio level of this modulator sine wave. So I'm going to drag off of the out envelope um, pin, and then I will add in my multiply audio node. I'm going to connect the out value of the map range to the first input, and we've already got the second, or the, sorry, that was the second input. We've already got the first input connected to the envelope. Second input should be connected to map range, and then we'll connect the output to the modulation input. Now, like our envelope up here, we're going to need to trigger this. And so I'm going to use the on next trigger. Again, I'm going to connect that to the trigger input here for this AD envelope. And then uh, we could say replace the, um, the input to this other trigger by the output of this on trigger um, of our AD envelope. So I'm just going to replace that existing connection and kind of do things in sequence here. So right now, if we hit play, you can hear we've got something different. And it sounds pretty cool. But um, to get even more of that kind of clicky type sound that I had in the intro, we can really, really reduce this decay time to something super small, like let's say 0.025. And you'll hear now there's just this little part at the beginning of the sound, this little blip that um, has that 
interesting little modulation component added to it. So definitely play around here, find a sort of length that you like, and or you can always change something like the multiplication node coming into the sine oscillator to get a slightly different sound. So we're almost done with this part of our project. The last thing that I want to do is to set up a way for us to get the current uh, sort of force of the collision, which we'll be able to access elsewhere in the project, and route that to the volume level of this sound that we're playing, so that as the uh, box starts to kind of settle down and stops colliding into things as much, uh, the sound will also decrease in volume. So what, to, what we can do for that is to add in an additional input. So I'm going to click the plus on the input section up here. And then I'm going to rename this input uh, name to impulse level. And then this is going to be a floating point value. So I'm going to leave that as it is. However, I do know that this is going to be attached to a volume uh, control. So I'm going to come down here to the value type option and set this to volume just so that we can kind of uh, see this a little bit more clearly in terms of dB or decibels. For the range here, I'm going to set the maximum to be negative three um, just so that we're attenuating a little bit off the top of that if we manipulate it by hand. And then I can drag this impulse level node onto the network and we have this nice little uh, dial that we can work with. Next up, we're going to clamp the output range of this impulse level knob. And I'm going to use the clamp, clamp float node for this. Here we just want to make sure that we can never move beyond a maximum of one because that will cause our audio output to clip and give us some distortion in the uh, speakers or headphones that we're listening to. Um, so from there, I want to take this output and I want to be able to convert this to an audio signal. So I'm going to go to this conversion section, use the float to audio node, and then one more time, we're going to use a multiply audio signals node. So I'm going to copy and paste that. I'll connect the um, output of this node into the second input here. And then we'll connect our first multiply node into the first input. And then we'll take the output of that and connect it to the out mono node. So that is everything for our um, meta sound source, we can now get to actually connecting uh, this to our project. Before we head out of this part of the network, though, I do want to make sure that I switch the input trigger to be from this on play uh, option that I had switched this to back to the on trigger uh, input instead, so that we are triggering this based on a collision instead of just starting play. Uh, so again, I've connected the output of this input on trigger node to the next uh, input pin on this random float node. And with that, we are ready to continue on. So back in our main Unreal Engine Editor window, we're going to continue on by creating ourselves a blueprint based on all these cubes that we have in our scene. So in the outliner on the right, we've got a ton of different objects and the cubes in particular that we're looking for all are found within this simulated cubes section. You'll see that we have a bunch of SM underscore chamfer cube options or um, objects here, which are all static mesh actors at the moment. We basically want to click on one of these and then uh, head down to the details portion of this window where we have an option to convert this into a reusable blueprint class. So I'm going to click on that and that's going to bring up this window here. It's given us a name and it's going to place it in this current folder that we're viewing in our content browser. This all looks good so I'm going to hit um, select and it's going to open up a window here where we can then take a look at our newly created blueprint. Now, um, before we move into the event graph part of this uh, blueprint, I'm going to head to 
in the details panel, this collision section. I first want to ensure that I've hit this checkbox for simulation generates hit events. And that's going to um, trigger a hit event, allowing us to use a blueprint to trigger some kind of functionality. And then next, I'm going to want to, um, under this physical material override, choose a different material option. I'm going to choose rubber for my uh, particular example so that this will bounce a little bit in my level. We want to double check that in this physical material rubber uh, that we've set our friction here to 0 0.5, that we've got our static friction set to zero so that this will kind of slide around a little bit. It'll be uh, quite bouncy. And the restitution, I believe, by default should be set to one. Assuming those things are correct, we can then head back into the node graph uh, or the, uh, the blueprint editor, rather, and then head to the event graph. We'll begin with the begin play node, which I'm going to drag off of the execute pin. And I'm going to add a spawn sound at, uh, or not at location, but spawn sound attached. So this is going to spawn the object with a sound attached to it. Uh, for the sound in question, I'm going to click this little drop down. And if we then look through our um, object viewer, or our asset viewer here, we should be able to find the blueprint that we set up earlier, the, the meta sound rather. So I'm going to scroll until we see a little green icon here to the left, and that will be our MS underscore collision meta sound source. That's what we want to attach to this particular um, object. We're then going to drag off of the attach to component pin, and this is going to be attaching to the root component associated with this object. So I'm going to type in root in this dialog and then hit get root component, which will attach this node here. From there, we're going to um, add in a couple of additional nodes. The first of these is going to be called an execute trigger parameter. And for this, we're going to need to turn the context sensitive switch off. And you'll see then that we have an execute trigger parameter, which is under the audio parameter section of the actions. I'm going to click that, and then I'm going to point uh, or connect the return value pin here to the target of this execute trigger parameter. So this is going to um, give this execute uh, trigger an object or a, uh, a sound attached to an object to actually start the playback of. For the in name, we're going to be using the name of the uh, trigger input that we set up previously, which if we don't remember was called on space trigger. And once we've added that in, we need a way, well, we need a way to actually execute this pin, which we're not going to do with the begin play um, execute because that will just trigger the sound to play immediately instead of looking for a collision. So we're going to add in a new type of event. So I'm going to right click up here in the event graph, and we're going to want a event called event hit. This is uh, something that'll be triggered on collision. We've got all kinds of different outputs that we can deal with here. And in particular, we want to use the normal impulse output, which is going to give us a vector which basically will show us the intensity or the force of the collision that our box is having with something else. We're going to convert that into a vector length um, using the math vector length function. And we're going to use that return value along with some logic to say, OK, if our normal impulse is ever above a certain level that impact is forceful enough, then we're going to trigger the sound to play. So I'm going to take this output pin here, drag off of that, and I'm going to use a greater than um, or a greater operator here. So I've added the greater operator in. And for the amount in this second uh, input, this is going to have to be greater than 10,000. So that sounds like a lot, but um, we don't want every tiny little 
uh, collision to generate sound. Otherwise, we'll be hearing lots and lots more sounds than we intend to. So this is a way to kind of gate the sound playback a little bit. We're going to connect that to a branch node. And so I'm going to grab the under flow control branch node. And that's going to be the condition for the branch. Then I'm going to connect the execute pin from the event hit to the input of this branch node. After that, uh, we actually now have a way to test the force the impact. And if this um, normal impulse is in fact greater than this, then we actually want it to trigger the sound. And so we're going to then drag off of the true pin here and connect it to the input execute pin of the execute trigger parameter. Now, the last thing that we need to do here is we also have the um, impulse level parameter that we set up, which is, again, the volume level of the output sound, which we're going to want to control with the amount or the force of the collision. So for that, I'm going to need an additional uh, execute or a uh, uh, parameter adjusting node. And so actually, it's not going to be an execute trigger parameter. It's going to be something else called a set float parameter. And we're going to head down here. This is going to be set float parameter under audio. I'm going to grab the first option here, sets a named float. And that should be a part of the audio parameter controller interface. Here, I'm going to connect the execute pin from the execute trigger parameter to it. I'm going to connect the output of the spawn sound attached node to the target. I'm going to set the in name here to impulse level, which was the name that we set uh, back in the meta sound editor. And then we need to do just a small amount of math to this uh, vector length. Uh, float that we've set up in order for it to come into that uh, parameter that we've set up at the correct sort of range. And to do that, I'm going to drag off of the return value pin. And here I want the normalize to range node. So this is going to take an input range and then uh, basically take the values that we're getting and remap them to a normalized range of 0 to 1. So for the range maximum, I used a value of 100,000, which again sounds like a lot, but um, this helped give a pretty good amount of difference between a small collision and a very large uh, forceful collision in terms of the volume level associated with it. So I've left the range minimum alone. I've set the range maximum to 100,000. I can then connect that to the in float parameter. And with that, we are actually all set with this node. So I can um, compile and save this. And then if we head back to our project and hit play, and then run into our boxes, we can see that we are generating sounds. But as you probably noticed, uh, we are not getting all that much bounciness like in the original version. So what I want to do in that case, the reason that that's happening is because we've only added in a single um, SM chamfer cube blueprint object to the scene. Everything else is still currently a static mesh actor. So I'm going to go ahead and select all of the additional simulated cubes in the scene. And I'll just zoom out here so that we can see this. I'm going to head over here to the outliner and uh, click on the first one that is within the simulated cube section. I'm going to shift and then holding down shift, uh, click on SM chamfer cube 18. And then I'm going to right click on that selection and replace the selected actors with. So um, what I want to do here is actually to replace all of these with the chamfer cube object uh, blueprint class over here in the content browser. So I'm going to make sure I've got that selected as well. So I've clicked on that once. I'm going to head back over here to my selection in the outliner, right click, 
and then replace selected actors with. And there it is, the SM Chamfer Cube blueprint. I'll click that. That'll have modified all of those objects. So they're now all, um, they all have the same properties as the initial one that we ran into. And if I hit play, we can then collide with these again and see that every time that they're hitting the ground, they're generating a new sound. On top of that, as you may have noticed, um, they're also much bouncier. They're kind of <laughs> kind of gaining a life of their own as they move around the level. Um, and you may or may not be able to tell depending on the compression in the audio, um, but the volume of those does in fact settle down over time. If you're finding that, let's say, the uh, volume range that you're getting between the more forceful impact and the sort of less forceful, smaller impact is not great enough, or maybe you're ending up with something that's a little bit too loud, uh, something that I'd recommend taking a look at in the MS Collision uh, Meta Sound is that you can set the clamp here on the output of the impulse level. You can set the maximum here a little bit lower so that it's kind of attenuating the maximum loudness that this can end up uh, reaching. The other thing to uh, think about in terms of loudness is that we do have a bunch of additional effects that we can uh, work with, including in the dynamics section, things like a limiter uh, or a compressor, which can also help to um, deal with situations where the sound maybe gets a little bit too loud um, at certain points. In terms of the uh, difference in the loudness for a, a soft impact versus a hard impact, you can always come back to the blueprint we set up for the chamfer cube and set this range maximum in this normalized two range to something higher, maybe like 200,000. Uh, but you can definitely experiment with that to find something that has a little bit uh, you know, better range for your particular application. Once you do that, though, make sure that you compile and save the object uh, before you try to test it again. Regardless of how you end up putting this technique to use, I hope that this has been a useful introduction to the world of metasounds, a little bit of uh, synthesis, and also working with collisions um, along with things like metasounds to generate uh, responses to different interactions. You know, these types of tools don't necessarily have to be used in a, a sort of silly uh, tongue-in-cheek way like this. Um, this could definitely be in response to any kind of user interaction. Um, and beyond that, uh, there's definitely possibilities to make all kinds of interesting, even musical things with it as well. So with that said, we're going to close out the video. Hope you've enjoyed putting this one together. Looking forward to seeing you in the next one. Thanks for watching.